the naked bodies of five murdered women are discovered in just 10 days. Totally unexpected. What are we dealing with here? What's happening in Suffolk? Sparking the biggest manhunt the east of England has ever seen. The Suffolk police went into overdrive. There was a serial killer on the loose in Ipswich. For the police, it became a race against time to stop the killer striking again. Who's going to be next? Is there any more girls missing? What's going to happen next? Am I going to be next? No. Yet their most powerful clues could only be seen through a microscope. There were two strands of forensic evidence which were going to be pivotal to this case. Fibre evidence and DNA evidence. This is the incredible story of how science helped crack the case of the Suffolk Strangler. In 2006, the Suffolk Strangler took the lives of five prostitutes in the town of Ipswich. The rapidity of the killings, five deaths in five weeks, triggered Britain's biggest manhunt since the Yorkshire Ripper. And over 200 detectives joined forces in a desperate bid to capture the murderer before they struck again. The killing spree began in mid-October, when the first victim disappeared from Ipswich's notoriously busy red light district. Ipswich is a port town, and no stranger to prostitution. But an escalating drug problem has seen an increase in the number of women working the streets. It's a situation that worries DCS Stuart Gull. There were in the region of a uh, hundred or more sort of prostitutes working in the Ipswich area, uh, highly vulnerable and at risk. Monday, the 30th of October, 2006. Local girl, Tanya Nicole, fails to return home. But there's something her family doesn't know. Tanya has been leading a double life. How much? 50 quid. Nothing weird. 20 more like. 30. For the last few weeks, Tanya's been working as a prostitute to support her drug habit. It's a scenario familiar to many of the local working girls, and the manner of Tanya's disappearance particularly concerns DCS Stuart Gall. She had literally disappeared off the face of the earth. Her phone records showed us a very flat line from the 1st of November, no incoming or outgoing movement of data at all and and again that was a real cause for concern just over two weeks later another girl 25 year old Gemma adams has been reported missing like tanya Gemma is also working the red light district to pay for her drug addiction it was then that we really started worrying are they still alive in a room somewhere, you know, or have Tanya and Gemma done this to a dealer and both of them are gone? You just don't really know when you're involved with drugs what the true reason is. As part of the investigation into Tanya's and Gemma's disappearance, the police questioned motorists in the area where the girls usually worked. Hey, hey, not, please, sir. You were two girls have gone missing. No. Tanya, Nicole, Gemma Adams mean anything to you? No. Those names don't mean anything to me. All right, move on. But despite stopping over 500 cars and questioning 2,000 people, no new information about the girls was found. On the morning of the 2nd of December, 
water bailiff, Trevor Saunders, is checking Belstead Brook for blockages after heavy rains have caused flooding. Notice what I thought at, the fir at first was a, a dummy, a mannequin. So got down into the water to get it out. On closer examination, Trevor discovers the true nature of what he's found. So I got down to pick it out and to clear the blockage. And when I got down to her, that's when I realized that no, it weren't a dummy, it was a real body. And immediately thought to myself that I found one of the missing girls. Trevor Saunders' discovery is relayed to Stuart Gull. Apart from that, nothing. Girl, someone's called in and they found a body. Where? In a stream behind some fisheries near Hintlesham. Let's keep a lid on this until we're sure of the facts. Can somebody let Tanya and Gemma's parents know that a body has been found? I don't want them hearing about it through the news. What do we say? Clearly, identification wasn't known at that stage, but you automatically fear for the worst, and you assume that it's perhaps either uh, Tanya or, or Gemma. Hearing where the body has been found, forensic officer David Stagg realises the magnitude of the task he's facing. The expectation of recovering forensic evidence from both the body and the, the scene where the body was found was actually quite low, because depositing a naked body in running water, you're not going to have much forensic evidence left whatsoever, so we knew we were up against it right from the start. The body is identified as Gemma Adams, and news of Gemma's death soon spreads. To hear that it was her, you know, just, uh, and well, you know, it's distraught me even, even now, you know, I don't like thinking about it, but, you know, it's, it just rips your insides out. The search for evidence intensifies. In freezing conditions, divers and forensic teams scour the area for almost a week. The search is about to be called off when a diver makes a shocking discovery. In December 2006, prostitutes Tanya Nicol and Gemma Adams went missing from the red light district of Ipswich. The naked body of Gemma had been recovered from a stream on the outskirts of town. But then during a forensic sweep of the area, a diver made another devastating discovery. Forensic officer David Stagg recalls hearing the news. I remember receiving the phone call um, alerting me that a second body had been found. And when I asked where and was told Belstead Brook, immediately the alarm bells were ringing. Less than two miles downstream from where Jem Adams was recovered, there's little doubt the second body is that of Tanya Nicol. Not in my wildest dreams did I anticipate that they would uncover the body of Tanya Nicol. We were now no longer dealing with uh, two missing persons. This was a, a double murder inquiry. Despite the similarities, the police know they can't assume the deaths are linked. I want an SIO assigned to each of these murders. I don't want anybody jumping to conclusions. We still need to keep an open mind that it could be just coincidence. Understood. Any news about the cause of death? Nothing concrete, sir. Bodies are in pretty bad shape. Have forensics turned up anything? Not yet. Seems the bodies were washed clean, but they're still looking. A post-mortem is conducted but with the two bodies having been immersed in water for so long, the results are inconclusive. Forensic scientist Ray Palmer knows retrieving any evidence will be near impossible. Because it actually been present in flowing water for a number of weeks, any prospect of recovering fibres or other debris from the skin, or even DNA from the skin, in that period of time was virtually zero. The murderer's choice of location 
indicates to criminologist David Wilson that the police are dealing with a methodical and calculating killer. The fact that he had placed the bodies in water so as to destroy any forensic evidence suggested to me this was a very, what criminologists would describe as organized killer. By organized, I mean that he's very carefully thought through how he's crucially going to avoid being detected from the police. With no evidence, the police need to find witnesses. They interview other women working in Ipswich's red light district. Thanks for coming in, Paula. One of them Appreciate is fellow that. prostitute Paula Clannell. Well, how old do you know, Tanya? Yeah, well enough. She's on the streets. She seemed nice enough. She had a cigarette before, you know. Pretty girl. When did you last see her? <laughs> so about a week ago. Maybe two. Can you remember exactly what date that was, or what day, or time? I think it was about 12.30, 1 a.m. maybe. Would have been in October, Burlington Road area. Burlington Road is one of only a handful of streets that make up Ipswich's red light district. The area is constantly monitored by CCTV cameras. To try and spot Tanya the night she went missing, police trawl through a staggering 16,000 hours of footage. Their dedication pays off. On tape, Tanya's spotted getting into a dark car, but the image isn't clear enough to get a match for the car's registration plate. Then, the discovery of yet another body on dry land. The motorist had reported finding what appeared to be the naked body of uh, a young female. A totally unexpected, um, totally unbelievable. Mind begins to race. What are we dealing with here? What's happening in Suffolk? The discovery of yet another body less than 48 hours after the start of the double murder inquiry, horrifies David Stagg. After the body of Tanya Nicole had been found, nobody really envisaged that this spree of murders would actually continue. And it came as a real shock to us when the third body was found. Not just because it was a third body, but the manner of deposition was entirely different to the first two. The body has been found on dry land in a secluded wood less than 10 miles from the center of Ipswich. But it's the way the body has been left that disturbs Stuart Gall. She was naked, she'd been posed, and the offender had clearly taken some time to uh, lay her out. The killer has arranged the body in the shape of a cross. She was pristine. She looked like an angel. Distinctive tattoos on the body establish the identity of the third murdered woman as mother of one, 24-year-old Anneli Alderton. No one had reported her missing. Like the other victims, Anneli had been working as a prostitute to pay for drugs. David Stagg knows, with the body on land, that this is the first real chance to recover clues to the killer's identity. The body of Annalee Alderton was deposited on dry land. That in itself was actually, from a forensic point of view, a breakthrough for us, because the potential for harvesting forensic evidence, not just from the body, but from the scene of the deposition, was much greater. The pathologist determines the cause of death as airway obstruction. Strangulation is a peculiarly intimate form of murder. The killer is expressing through that method of murder the ultimate form of power 
and control over the life of another individual. The examination also reveals another tragic aspect to the murder. Anelli was three months pregnant. The revelation changes everything for crime reporter Josh Warwick. I think when it emerged that Anneli was pregnant, it brought a different dimension to the reporting of the case and people's attitude. It brought a very, a very human and raw feel to the story all of a sudden. Breakthroughs still prove elusive. A witness reports seeing Anneli boarding a train a week before her body was found. CCTV cameras on the train show her as she makes that journey, but no further information turns up. With the discovery of three murder victims in less than a week, all with such similar backgrounds, criminologist David Wilson has little doubt about the type of murderer the police are chasing. When the third body turned up, I think I was the first person to say there is a serial killer on the loose in Ipswich. And I think those words I chose with a great deal of care because they were, as far as I was concerned, accurate. And they also should have suggested, which I think they did, the gravity of the circumstances. The grisly discovery of three bodies brings the world's media to Ipswich. What happened almost overnight as this crisis was developing was that the streets became filled only with one group of people, and that group of people was journalists. Um, journalists seemed to be bumping into each other, desperately hoping to find a prostitute that they could interview. Despite the fact that a killer seems to be targeting prostitutes, most of the girls continue to work the streets as usual. We were all worried and obviously scared, but we all had to go to work anyway. You know, we, we had drug addictions, we had addictions to feed. On the 11th of December, the police issued a statement urging the 40 or so working girls to get off the streets of Ipswich. They also expressed concern for the city's wider female population, who were now enjoying the Christmas party season. But the warnings were ignored. Go. Two more girls have been reported missing. Annette Nichols. Say again? Paula Clennell. The newly reported missing women are identified as mother of three, Paula Clennell, whom the police had questioned earlier about the disappearances, and 29-year-old Annette Nichols. Annette's disappearance hits Jade Reynolds hard. She was my best friend. Really, yeah, the most amazing person I've ever met in my life. You know, she, oh, she changed my life for the better. Just six days before she had gone missing, Paula Clonell had been interviewed by a local TV crew. Why, why have you decided to come out tonight? Because I need the money. I need the money, you know? Despite the dangers? Well, that has made me a bit wary about getting into cars, you know? But presumably you, you will do that tonight? Well, probably. Following the two new disappearances, the police organize a press conference. Reporter Josh Warwick is stunned by the turn of events. The shock and the, uh, the amazement of, of everybody, certainly ourselves, when uh, we were told that these are two other women that have been reported missing, both prostitutes, both drug addicts, was, uh, it was unbelievable, really. You know, it was just incredible. Less than 24 hours after the press conference, more news. Gov, they found another body. Where? In the woods close to where Anne Lee Alderson's body was found. We're already sort of still reel reeling from 
the discovery of uh, Anna Lee Alderton on the Sunday. Get as many people out there as possible. I want the crime scene locked down and preserved. Well, that way. I was still surprised, shocked, uh, dismayed, and of course realised um, the severity and the magnitude of what we what we were now dealing with. Within the space of just six weeks in 2006, five prostitutes disappeared from Ipswich's notorious red light district. The bodies of three of the women had already been recovered, but the community was praying that the other two girls might still be found alive. Then the police received word that yet another body had been found, this time in Woodland, alongside the Felixstowe Road in Nacton. A helicopter observation team relay images back to police headquarters. I can remember looking at the screen and seeing what, what clearly appeared to be the, the dumped and crumpled body of a, of a naked female. The police continued to search the area, and for helicopter observer Maggie Williams, there are more horrors to come. I put the camera onto the first body. And we decided as a crew that we should really search the rest of the wood. And as I swung the camera around, panned the camera around, and came into view on the screen was another body. And that was, yeah, the realisation, the gruesome discovery that, yes, there were two bodies there in the same location, fairly close to each other. Back at police headquarters, Stuart Gull was stunned by the images coming in. It probably took a few moments for the pennies to drop, but it then dawned on me we now had a fourth and fifth victim. That was a particularly difficult time. The police soon confirm the bodies are those of Paula Clonell and Annette Nichols. That's the one that hit me the worst, and still does to this day, is Annette. I can't believe she's dead. I can't believe she's gone, really. Don't want to believe it, but I have to. A post-mortem shows Paula died following compression to the neck. But Annette's death remains a mystery. Tragically, all five of the missing women have been found dead. Stuart Gull reluctantly announces the police are looking for a serial killer. Whilst we only had a cause of death for two, in all probability, all had died as, as a result of some form of interference with the airway. So you put all of that together, and I think quite rightly, we drew the conclusion that we were looking for just one or more persons who were involved together uh, in the abduction and murder of all five women. 600 officers and staff from within Suffolk are now assisted by a further 500 from around the country. It's the biggest police manhunt the East of England has ever seen. With the announcement that a serial killer is at large, media attention dramatically increases. I think you'll agree there's little doubt that the murders are the work of one person or persons working together. We had a number of people of interest, um, a small number at that stage, but it's a very uh, methodical, very sort of scientific process that you need to go, th go through. You can't declare everybody a suspect, uh, uh, um, otherwise you make no progress at all. One name seems to offer itself up. Following an interview with the newspaper in which he admits to knowing the five victims, 37-year-old supermarket worker, Tom Stevens is taken into custody. In custody and helping police with their inquiries, the man who lived here is being held by police hunting the Suffolk serial killer. The police 
had to arrest Tom Stevens on that occasion because, if in effect, he said, I knew all of these five women, they've all been back to my house, I do not have an alibi for the nights that they went missing. In those circumstances, the police would have been bonkers not to have arrested somebody who's openly saying that. Without solid evidence, the police know they'll soon have to let Stevens go. Then, the forensic team take an extraordinary step forward. Tiny amounts of DNA are retrieved from the bodies of Anneli Alderson, Annette Nichols, and Paula Clonell, the three women found on dry land. My initial feeling was, was one of surprise, bearing in mind the very hostile environment that these young women had been found in. I wasn't over-optimistic that we'd recover um, forensic material as quickly as we did. The forensic team's objective is to see if this DNA is that of the killer. But there's a problem. There may not be enough DNA to examine accurately. To be able to identify the DNA's genetic fingerprint, the team need a certain amount of DNA. By using a technique known as polymerase chain reaction, the strands of DNA retrieved from the bodies are copied over and over again providing the team with enough genetic material to analyze. The findings stun David Stagg. I remember when um, I was notified that we had a DNA hit uh, that linked firstly two of the bodies and then subsequently all three of the land deposited bodies. And initially it was a feeling of disbelief. It's a one in a billion result. The DNA retrieved from three separate bodies, all linked back to the same person. But who? The samples are checked against the National DNA Database. Gov, forensics managed to pull some DNA off one of the bodies. Have they found a match with the DNA? Yeah, they have. Tom Stevens? No, local man by the name of Stephen Wright. Steve Wright wasn't on our radar at that particular time. He was already in the system. He'd actually been stopped on an anniversary road check in respect of the disappearance of Tanya Nicol. All right, move on. It's quickly established that Wright works locally as a forklift driver and lives on London Road, one of the streets that make up Ipswich's red light district. Put him under 24-hour surveillance. See what turns up. Got it. The Suffolk police know Wright's arrest has to be handled carefully. Wright is placed under 24-hour observation. Once the suspect had been identified as Steve Wright, there was an incredible amount of planning went into the arrest phase. And from our perspective, the real detail around it was how were we going to deal forensically with his house, with his car, with him when he comes into custody. By giving the forensic team time to prepare for Wright's arrest, Stuart Gall knew he was taking a calculated risk. Having deferred the arrest of Steve Wright for 24 hours, I effectively put a ring of steel around him. I couldn't afford for him to be at large. With the forensic team's preparation complete, in the early hours of the 19th of December, the police arrive at 79 London Road. Stephen Wright? Yes. Stephen Wright, I'm arresting you on suspicion of the murders of Tanya Nicholl, Annalee Alderton, Gemma Adams, Paula Clonell, and Annette Nichols. The 48-year-old man was arrested at his home address in Ipswich at approximately 5 a.m. this morning, Tuesday, the 19th of December. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defense if you fail to mention something that you later rely on in court. He has been arrested 
on suspicion of murdering all five women. The police conducts a background check of the man they believe capable of killing five young women. Born in Norfolk in 1958, Wright was to lead an unhappy childhood, with his mother leaving home soon after his eighth birthday. With no qualifications, Wright drifted from job to job before working as a steward on the QE2 for six years. In 1988, Wright set himself up as a pub landlord, but with little success. With two failed marriages, and a mounting gambling debt, Wright found work as a barman at the Brook Hotel. After he was caught stealing 80 pounds from the till, his DNA was entered into the national database. A few weeks before Tanya and Nicole went missing, Wright was to move into 79 London Road at the heart of Ipswich's red light district. What's intriguing about serial killers is not the fact that they are the epitome of evil, but rather they are the banality of evil. It's their ordinariness that sticks out. And when I first got to know more about the background of Steve Wright, what struck me was, again, that sense of the everyday nature of who serial killers are. Wright is questioned by the Suffolk police. Come on, Steve. You're telling me you've never even been tempted to go with a prostitute? No comment. When he was arrested, he said no comment during the first eight hours of interviews. We've got the last girl to go missing with your DNA, and the one before with your DNA, both on their naked bodies. And how can that be? No comment. Even without a confession, the DNA recovered from the bodies was sufficient evidence for the police to charge Wright with the murders of all five women and release former prime suspect Tom Stevens. But the case was still far from watertight. Wright's trial is set for January 2008. The pressure is now on for the forensic teams to find conclusive evidence linking Wright to the five murdered women. The police impound Wright's car. As part of our forensic strategy, we identified Steve Wright's car as a, a key exhibit that needed to be examined in, in fine detail, not just for fibre evidence, but evidence of any other transfers. But there's a potential problem. Neighbours report seeing Wright obsessively cleaning his car at all times of the day and night. Undeterred by Wright's efforts, the forensic team set about the painstaking task of lifting fibres from the car in the hope they'll be able to match them with the fibres found on the bodies. Their efforts finally pay off. The first significant finding that we came up with related to the tapings that had been taken from Annette Nichols. What we found on these tapings was a fake fur fibre. When we came to look at Steve Wright's vehicle, we found two of these fibres inside the footwell, which matched the fake fur fibre from Annette's tapings exactly. Then, the fibre analysis team make another critical discovery. What we found on tapings from the rear seat were a number of very, very tiny flakes of blood. Completely unexpected finding, but nevertheless, highly significant. By recombining the individual flakes of blood into a single droplet, 
enough DNA is recovered to allow a match. The blood belongs to Paula Clonell. And when Wright's fluorescent jacket is subjected to a microscopic examination, they find more of Paula's blood, as well as Annette Nichols. I did a totally new complexion to the forensic evidence against Steve Wright, because whereby we'd earlier had evidence that could be explained away by general contact with these people, innocent contact uh, as perhaps a customer, the transfer of blood was something that potentially was far more sinister. With Wright's make of car now known, the CCTV footage is re-examined. His Mondeo is spotted leaving Ipswich the night Gemma Adams failed to meet her boyfriend. The model also matches the car Tanya Nicole was seen climbing into. The police now have compelling evidence linking Wright to an Ellie Alderton, Paula Clonell and Annette Nichols. But a positive link to Tanya Nicole and Gemma Adams, who were found in running water, still remains elusive. Without that link, the entire case could be in jeopardy. On the 19th of December, 48-year-old Steve Wright was arrested on suspicion of murdering five women. Both the forensic evidence and CCTV linked Wright directly to the victims found on land. But recovering clues from the first two victims, Tanya Nicole and Gemma Adams, who had both been dumped in streams, was proving near impossible. To try and establish a link between Wright and the first two murders, the forensic team set about collecting everything caught in Tanya and Gemma's hair. They extract over two kilograms of debris. Sifting through the material, the team then spent weeks microscopically examining every tiny particle. Against all the odds, they find what they're looking for. Colored fibers trapped deep in Gemma's hair. In particular, we found blue polyester microfibers which matched Steve Wright's tracksuit bottoms. We found red acrylic fiber which were present in Steve Wright's car and on his sofa in his living room. But it's to be a single fiber extracted from Tanya's hair that will provide the final link in the forensic chain. Well, in the case of this fiber here, uh, we recovered this from the uh, hair debris of uh, Tanya Nicol, which is a, a black nylon fiber with a very distinctive cross section and this type of fiber is very commonly used in the construction of carpets. But where did the black fiber come from? Once again, Wright's Mondeo provides the answer. The fiber matches the car's carpet. That was crucial to us because it put Tanya to his car, but it begs the question, how on earth has carpet fibers got in her hair? There was only one conclusion uh, that we could come to, and that is her head had been in forcible contact with the, the footwells of that car. Uh, that could either have been during the uh, strangulation process or as the body was actually transported to the point of deposition. The forensic team now have good evidence linking right to all five victims. On the 14th of January, 2008, the trial of Steve Wright begins. We were under intense pressure and scrutiny. We felt the weight of expectation. But of course, until the evidence is delivered before the jury, you really don't know which way the case is going to go. Wright pleads not guilty to all five charges of murder. 
For 15 days, the prosecution lay out the forensic and CCTV evidence against him. On the 7th of February, Steve Wright takes the stand in his own defense. He tries to offer a plausible explanation why his DNA may have been found on the murdered women. I had sex with Gemma Adams in the back of my car. Wright also admits to picking up Tanya Nichol, but insists she was only in his car for a brief period. When she got in the car, she had acne on her face, and it put me off quite a bit, really. I thought Steve Wright was particularly cruel in his description of Tanya Nichol. That seemed to me to be a revealing insight into the psychological process that he had gone through to objectify those young women, thus making it easier for him to kill them. But Wright's explanations soon start to fall apart. Under the barrage of questions that came towards him, he literally could not maintain any control as the horrible, dreadful truth seeped out to the extent that he started to say, No, I did not. I can't answer that. I couldn't say. You might say that. I don't know where the blood came from. Wright's trial lasted for over a month. But on Thursday, the 21st of February, 2008, after just eight hours of deliberation, the jury of nine men and three women returned to deliver their unanimous verdict. Guilty on all five counts of murder. When the guilty verdict came in, there was a, a tremendous amount of relief for, for a start, but also a tremendous amount of pride, particularly from the forensic side, because we knew we played such an important part in the investigation. The judge handed right a whole life sentence. Steve Wright will die in prison. This was about bringing a serial murder to, to justice and justice seeing to be done. But more than anything, um, uh, relief for the families that they can now bring some, some closure to a very difficult period during, during their lives. Today, Ipswich's red light district has all but disappeared. Helping erase the memory of those tragic days in December. But for some, the emotional scars left by the death of five young women still run as deeply today. People want to see me cry, they can see me cry, you know, because this is real, this is what happened, you know, these people I knew, and I'm not going to not cry because of it. You know, they were my friends. That's mine and Gemma's tree. No matter what her, what her job was, what she'd done, she was still a human being and a young one at that. So hopefully every year that will be in full colour, just to bring the rosiness back to her cheeks wherever she is now. Crime Zone continues next on Quest with Amanda Burton as she investigates the murder of a mother, her three sons, and her mother in law. That's in Killer Forensics. The naked bodies of five murdered women are discovered in just 10 days. Totally unexpected. What are we dealing with here? What's happening in Suffolk? Sparking the biggest manhunt the East of England has ever seen. The Suffolk police went into overdrive. There was a serial killer on the loose in Ipswich. For the police, it became a race against time to stop the killer striking again. Who's going to be next? Is there any more girls missing? What's going to happen next? Am I going to be next? No. Yet their most powerful clues could only be seen through a microscope. There were two strands of forensic evidence which are going to be pivotal to this case. Fibre evidence and DNA evidence. 
This is the incredible story of how science helped crack the case of the Suffolk Strangler. In 2006, the Suffolk Strangler took the lives of five prostitutes in the town of Ipswich. The rapidity of the killings, five deaths in five weeks, triggered Britain's biggest manhunt since the Yorkshire Ripper. And over 200 detectives joined forces in a desperate bid to capture the murderer before they struck again. The killing spree began in mid-October, when the first victim disappeared from Ipswich's notoriously busy red light district. Ipswich is a port town, and no stranger to prostitution. But an escalating drug problem has seen an increase in the number of women working the streets. It's a situation that worries DCS Stuart Gull. There were in the region of a uh, hundred or more sort of prostitutes working in the Ipswich area, uh, highly vulnerable and at risk. Monday, the 30th of October, 2006. Local girl, Tanya Nicole, fails to return home. But there's something her family doesn't know. Tanya has been leading a double life. How much? 50 quid. Nothing weird. 20 more like. 30. For the last few weeks, Tanya's been working as a prostitute to support her drug habit. It's a scenario familiar to many of the local working girls. And the manner of Tanya's disappearance particularly concerns DCS Stuart Gall. She had literally disappeared off the face of the earth. Her phone records showed us a very flat line from the 1st of November, no incoming or outgoing movement of data at all and and again that was a real cause for concern just over two weeks later another girl 25 year old Gemma adams has been reported missing like tanya Gemma is also working the red light district to pay for her drug addiction it was then that we really started worrying are they still alive in a room somewhere, you know, or have Tanya and Gemma done this to a dealer and both of them are gone? You just don't really know when you're involved with drugs what the true reason is. 